गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट गना शॉर्ट में आप सबका स्वागत है वनकम प्रणाम एंड जय हिंद आज हम बात करेंगे रिटर्न ऑफ ग्लोबल टेरर और इंडिया के ऊपर क्या असर होगा और इम्प्लीकेशन फॉर इंडिया क्या है उनके बारे में बात करेंगे इन सब चीजों के बारे में बात करने के लिए हमारे साथ हैं जनरल हसनैन सर गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट वंस अगेन जय हिंद गुड इवनिंग माई प्लेजर टू बी विद यू अगेन बट माई एम एस अपोलोजाइज दैट आई थिंक वी हैव डिलेड आर a uh, very very valuable audience a little bit because i had a commitment that's why i i must thank you sir ki aapne aapka commitment commitment ke bawajood aap aaye and i think that is more for every one of us so for a for a senior person like you with so many commitments uh, to spare time for uh, you know i would say the common people of india something great and we, <laughs> we need are all the common people of india we are all the putting common heads people together, together. We're putting our heads together heads together so today we'll talk of two things you know we, you aap aur hum baat karte rahe hain ki dehshat gardi duniya mein badh raha hai aur ye wapas aane wala hai aur ye the next wave of global terror is on the way ek taraf wo hai which is the main focus aaj ka jo इवेंट मतलब प्रोग्राम बट इन द पास्ट वन वीक वी हैव सीन समथिंग फ्रॉम अनयूजुअल हैपनिंग इन पाकिस्तान वो गार्डियन का एक वो आर्टिकल निकला है जहां उन्होंने दे हैव पुट फिंगर्स एट अस दैट वी हैव डन एक्स्ट्रा ज्यूडिशियल किलिंग्स इन पाकिस्तान एंड दे हैव लिंक्ड इट अप विद व्हाट्स हैपनिंग इन कनाडा एंड यूएसए प्लस वेरी सरप्शियसली which many people don't know this chap gulam nabi pai who is a you know lobbyist pakistani lobbyist in uh, usa he has started putting out stories uh, equating kosovo with kashmir and all that so if you add that and what's happened in the guardian article together i think jo pakistan jo hai wo ek base bana raha hai ki dobara dehshat gardi hamare aur shuru kare so this is the second part of the story but the first is the main thing jab tak hum uske bare mein we don't understand i think this one which the new narrative which is coming out of pakistan also will be difficult to uh, handle absolutely so this is the base i'm putting it across aap baat kijiye aapka opening ye comment de diye then we'll go through a small presentation which i have and then iske bare mein discuss kare thank you my good introduction और आपका सेगमेंटेशन जो है बिल्कुल सही है लेट मी स्टार्ट बाय सेइंग आई हैव रिटन अ कपल ऑफ आर्टिकल्स हाल ही में एक आया है जो रशिया के ऊपर था जब ये अटैक हुआ था रशिया में रिसेंट और उससे पहले भी पिछले दो तीन साल में आई हैव बीन रेगुलरली कीप राइटिंग ऑन ऑन द इशू ऑफ ग्लोबल टेरर मेरी थियोरी यह है मैं ज्यादा पीछे नहीं जाऊंगा माई थियोरी इज दैट टू was the last major effort when uh, isis or the islamic state uh, gave or gave us a last ditch battle at the, at mosul primarily mosul was defeated there over a period of 6 to 9 months it tried to fight if you remember it tried to fight absolutely conventional uh, it was defeated what everyone thought was it was completely uh, you know sort of vanquished it that, that is not true wo oh, वैंकुश नहीं हुआ था मगर एक नेटवर्क स्टेट में वो एग्जिस्ट कर रहा था जस्ट लाइक द अलकायदा आफ्टर बीइंग प्रेशराइज्ड इन अफगानिस्तान रिमेन इन अ नेटवर्क स्टेट और ज्यादातर ये सोशल मीडिया ज्यादातर इंटरनेशनल नेटवर्क्स जो हैं ये इंटरनेट के नेटवर्क्स जो हैं इसके जरिए एक फैसिलिटेशन हो गया है टेररिस्ट वर्ल्ड में एक तो प्रोपोगंडा साइकोलॉजिकल वॉरफेयर फाइनेंशियल ट्रेनिंग कोऑर्डिनेशन कॉन्फ्रेंसेस ये सब चीजें इसकी सहूलियत जो है वो इंटरनेट के जरिए इनको मिल गई है इंटरनेट एंड सोशल मीडिया के जरिए मिल गई है सो आफ्टर 2018 इस्लामिक स्टेट ट्राइड वेरी हार्ड एज द लीडिंग टेरर ग्रुप ऑफ द वर्ल्ड टू फाइंड अ प्लेस अ फिजिकल प्लेस फॉर इट सेल्फ इट ट्राइड इन फिलीपींस इट ट्राइड इन सदर इंडिया इट ट्राइड इन श्रीलंका बांग्लादेश में कोशिश की मगर कहीं पर ये टिक नहीं पाए or then they finally went into the area of nangahar in uh, 
इन अफगानिस्तान नॉर्दर्न अफगानिस्तान में जाकर वहां पर ये टिके जाकर एंड फाउंड दैट दैट्स एन एरिया व्हिच वाज नॉट बीइंग एड्रेस बाय द तालिबान नॉट बीइंग एड्रेस बाय द अमेरिकंस सो मोस्ट ऑफ द टेरर ग्रुप्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड हु हैव हु वेयर इन अ नेटवर्क स्टेट एंड नीडेड अ सम काइंड ऑफ अ फिजिकल एंटिटी टू सरवाइव विद ऑल ग्रेविटेटेड टू दैट एरिया उससे सबसे ज्यादा खतरा जो है वो दोबारा वापस इसी रीजन में आ गया साउथ एशिया दैट्स पाकिस्तान इंडिया अफगानिस्तान और नई एक दिशा जो है टुवर्ड्स सेंट्रल एशिया जो आपने अभी देखा रशिया में होते हुए रशिया के अंदर बहुत दहशतगरी हुई है पहले लॉट्स ऑफ टेररिस्ट अटैक्स हैव टेकन प्लेस लार्ज टेररिस्ट अटैक्स हैव टेकन प्लेस मोस्ट ऑफ देम वे लिंक्ड टू द चेचेन रेबल्स एट दैट टाइम मगर दैट प्रॉब्लम डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट टू दैट एक्सटेंड टुडे एंड व्हाट वी फाइंड दिस पर्टिकुलर अटैक इज ए मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ द एंट्री ऑफ some of these groups including the inter uh, the islamic state into central asia the last issue to just keep in mind here is 2018 ke baad jab ye koshishein ho rahi thi 2020 mein uh, you suddenly found the pandemic a pandemic ka asar jo hai bahut zabardast asar hua hai terror ke upar movement freedom of movement was curbed hugely in this case and led they suffered large scale casualties themselves and you found um, it ebbing ग्लोबल टेरर एब होने लगा मगर जब 2021 में अगस्त में जब अमेरिकन ने विद्रॉ किया और अफगानिस्तान से वो स्पेस वापस आ गई और उसके अंदर कोशिश होने लगी कॉन्टेस्टेशन होने लगा पाकिस्तान के अंदर कॉन्टेस्टेशन होने लगा ये सब चीजें इसी एरिया के अंदर चलती रही हालांकि किसी की तवज्जो किसी की फोकस जो थी वो अफ्रीका वेस्टर्न अफ्रीका और ईस्टर्न अफ्रीका पर नहीं थी और आ, मैं मैं समझता हूं आप इसके ऊपर थोड़ा दिखाएंगे अपने स्लाइड्स में भी कि कितनी ज्यादा इसके ऊपर फोकस दुनिया की हुई है बट द लॉन्ग एंड शॉर्ट ऑफ दिस इंट्रोडक्शन इज दैट बाय 2021 एन एफर्ट टू कम बैक वाज बीइंग मेड यूक्रेन जो यूक्रेन में हुआ है और जो गाजा में खासतौर पर हुआ है और जो हो रहा है ये होती इसके साथ ऑल दिस इज गिविंग एन इम्पेटस to bring back bring back the radical ideology linked with global terror right sir to jaise aapne bola i just put together a few slides jisse aapko ek overview milega ki yani haste kya baat kar rahe hain what is he talking of right people think oh there's no terror there's, it's all disparate things going on it's not so there's a pattern and here is the pattern these are the 10 countries which are impacted by terrorism it starts with burkina faso israel mali pakistan syria afghanistan somalia nigeria myanmar and niger so jo general hasnain bol rahe the the and aap map mein bhi dekh sakte ho the central region of africa africa mein zyada hai hamare dono wings mein to the east and west myanmar aur pakistan mein zyada ho raha hai afghanistan mein zyada ho raha hai to ab ye sab dekhenge to there is a marked increase these are the 10 top countries aur bhi hain but major acha aur agar hum dekhenge to kuch haal hi mein aap pichle 6 7 mahine mein ka ka major attacks hue hain pakistan moscow iran jahan wo मेजर जनरल सोलामानी का वो एनिवर्सरी के ऊपर अटैक हुआ था सीरिया इसराइल हमास नाइजीरिया मलेशिया का जो है अभी शुरुआत हो रहा है हाल ही में मैंने चार दिन पहले देखा था सर कि वहां एक मॉल के अंदर फायरिंग हो गया और कुछ फटाके जल गए क्यों किसी ने कुछ अगेंस्ट इस्लामिक यू नो रिलीजियस सिंबल्स कुछ काम किया या सुना सुनने में आया ऐसे हुआ तो देर वॉज अ रिएक्शन सो दिस होल थिंग इज रीस्टार्टिंग मलेशिया इसीलिए मैंने बताया क्योंकि आपको याद है तो बाली बॉम्बिंग्स हुए थे एक जमाने में इंडोनेशिया बगल में ही है दैट एंटायर एरिया इज ऑल्सो इस्लामिक बेल्ट विच हैज सफर्ड ड्यू टू टेररिज्म बट दैट टेररिज्म इज डिफरेंट बट आइडियोलॉजी जो है वो फैलता है ओके okay. ये इसमें अगर हम देखेंगे तो दो चार चीजें हैं जो इंटरेस्टिंग चीजें हैं वो ये है 
डेथ्स फ्रॉम टेररिज्म आर नाउ एट देयर हाईएस्ट लेवल सिंस 2017 जो आपने 2018 के बाद कही ये ग्लोबल टेररिज्म इंडेक्स इज फ्रॉम 2017 बट लोअर बाय 25% देन द पीक इन 2015 व्हाट डज इट टेल इट टेल्स दैट टेररिज्म इज ऑन द अप लार्जेस्ट फॉर्म फॉल्स इन टेररिज्म सिंस 2007 इज इन इराक अफगानिस्तान एंड नाइजीरिया ओके इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग इज पाकिस्तान में बढ़ गया अफगानिस्तान में कम हो गया सो द एपिसेंटर ऑफ टेरर इज शिफ्टिंग टू पाकिस्तान व्हिच इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस आई एम श्योर यू विल स्पीक अबाउट इट आल्सो द एपिसेंटर ऑफ टेररिज्म हैज शिफ्टेड फ्रॉम मिडिल ईस्ट एंड नॉर्थ अफ्रीका इनटू सब-सहारन अफ्रीका कंसंट्रेटेड लार्जली इन द सहेल रीजन दिस रीजन नाउ अकाउंट्स फॉर ऑलमोस्ट हाफ ऑफ द डेथ्स फ्रॉम टेररिज्म ग्लोबली बट ये ग्लोबल व्यू है बट हमारे जहां है पाकिस्तान में बढ़ रहा है terrorism has become more concentrated over the past decade yani ki terrorist activities are concentrated pehle kaha har jagah hota tha par abhi bade vyakyaye ho rahi hain south asia has the highest regional average impact from terrorism although it improved for the past one year but south asia south asia mein kaun kaun se afghanistan pakistan aur myanmar right total deaths from terrorism are now considerably higher in Sub-Saharan Africa than any other region. वहीं conflicts भी सबसे ज़्यादा हो रहे हैं. The four terrorist groups responsible the most deaths in 2023 were Islamic State, Hamas, Jamaat Nusrat Al Islam, Al Muslimin, and Al Shabab. The countries with the highest number of attacks are not attributed to a group. Where Myanmar, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Pakistan. So you will see. हमारे दाहिने और बाएं यानी ईस्ट एंड वेस्ट म्यांमार में और पाकिस्तान में ओवरऑल टेररिज्म हैज इंक्रीज बुरकिनो पैसो माली आर इन अफ्रीका सो वी विल लीव इट देम आउट एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम आईएस इन सीरिया इज द मोस्ट एक्टिव इट हैज बीन इन 10 इयर्स विद अटैक्स राइजिंग बाय 4% टू 224 और इन 2023 सीरिया इज अ हॉट स्पॉट कॉन्फ्लिक्ट रिमेंस द प्राइमरी ड्राइवर ऑफ टेररिस्ट एक्टिविटी Over 90% of terror attacks in 2023 occurred in conflict zones. ये एक बहुत बड़ा important point point है. Conflict and terror have got amalgamated, giving rise to a new hybrid form of conflict. जो आप हर वक्त बात करते रहते. क्या हम prepared हैं? एक तो hybrid terror को रोकने के लिए. क्या are we ready to go into a hybrid form of warfare? Not terrorism, but hybrid. form of warfare is something which we can discuss okay aage hum dekhenge to largest decreases in terror kahan hai afghanistan somalia mali iraq myanmar mozambique wagara 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 highest increases kahan hai ab dekhiye israel burkina faso niger pakistan nigeria syria baaki cameroon colombia aur uganda wagara wagara hai but wahi baat hai हमारे इर्द गिर्द काफी इंक्रीज है ओके एंड वन स्लाइड आई एम मिसिंग सम हा ये आप मैंने आपको दिखा दिया सर यू कुड टेक ऑफ फ्रॉम हियर एंड यू कुड एक्सप्लेन व्हाट इज द होल स्टोरी ओके जनशंकर ने आपको काफी डिटेल में भी समझाया है विद सम पैरामीटर्स स्टैटिस्टिक्स एसेट्रा द एरियाज मैं आपको एक कुछ सरमाइजेस देता हूं as the way i look at it for example if you look at africa sub saharan africa if you look at uh, east africa in particular they are relatively underdeveloped areas or yahan jo aapko terrorist activity mili hai al shabab and uh, boko haram etc these organizations have essentially been surrogates ye isis ke surrogates hain ek zamane mein nicholas ये सब निकले हैं मदर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन अलकायदा से ठीक है मगर लेटर ऑन दे बिकेम द एक्चुअल सरोगेट्स ऑफ द इस्लामिक स्टेट दे दे ओ अलीजियंस दे हैव ओड अलीजियंस टू इट टू अ ग्रेट एक्सटेंट ऑफ कोर्स दे आर नॉट एब्सोल्युटली अ पार्ट ऑफ इट बट एज आई सेड दे आर सरोगेट्स एंड दे कंटिन्यू टू होल्ड द फोर्ट इन अफ्रीका इट इज लाइक सेइंग के अभी हालत जो है इतनी ज्यादा नहीं बिगड़ी है बट they attempt to try and bring about a 
a radical political Islam in some of these areas in Africa, those efforts are continuing. And no one is looking at this year, next year or five years. It is a long term effort. The Americans call it the long war. It can go on for the next 200 years, this kind of a war, right? So when you're looking at ideological changes taking place and because of which terror attacks are taking place, be sure that this is some long term activity. You will put an end to it for some time, tactically, operationally, but strategically, it will still continue to lie low and come back at some stage. That's exactly what is happening in Africa at the moment. Right? That's exactly what happened in Afghanistan, if you see. And uh, in Afghanistan, you saw that as soon as the presence of the Americans was removed from there, efforts went, came in with different, different groups, all attempting to try and get that limited space which has been there, expanding themselves into other areas like Central Asia. Central Asia, you should be aware, has a presence of 72 million Muslims, not very developed. It's an area where political Islam has not made inroads. Because you remember, the Soviet Union is the one which was the dominant force here right through the Cold War. So any, any kind of a, a radical ideology did not enter at that time at all. Subsequently, huge efforts have been made to try and make inroads into Central Asia. They have not entirely succeeded. But now the first sign seems to be coming about. There are other movements also here which are linked to this. The East Turkestan movement, as it's called. That's again a very, very important one. Uh, there are groups which are linked to the to the to the Uyghurs, which are there in Xinjiang. China is not free of terror, let me tell you. China has got a huge scope, the western part of China. There is huge scope of turmoil, turbulence in this complete area if it gets effectively networked with the international terror organizations. So these are some of the activities which have been happening in this area. The area which is relatively quiet for the last couple of years is Europe. You will see we saw a mass upsurge, a mass inf uh, not infiltration, but a movement of immigrants into, into Europe, which took place in 2016, 17, 18, 19, is still taking place even now. Large number of them have settled in different cities. F approximately four to five million people got evicted from, uh, from Syria and moved into Turkey and Greece and th there on onto Germany, etc. It upset the overall social the social political balance in Europe. And you found that a new generation of immigrants trying to settle in there at odds with the interests of those who were already here. Europe, the problem in Europe is that it's a dwindling population. It's an aging population. They need labor forces. If labor forces have to be brought in and these forces themselves are coming in from Africa or from the Middle East, at some stage, they are likely to become very prone to this kind of a radical ideology. And this is what led to the, if you remember, the ISIS links from West Asia onto Belgium, onto Paris, into, uh, into, into France, Spain, mm. the UK, everywhere. Now, all this has quietened down at the moment. There is no, if you see the, the excellent uh, slides which John Shankar has put out, there is no activity of this kind in taking place in Europe. At the moment, it is all around here. Malaysia, let me just particularly add this thing. Uh, there was a state, and you mentioned by, by John Shankar, the Bali bombings, Indonesia, Philippines, Southern Thailand, Malaysia. This was a region about 20 years ago, which was in reasonable turmoil, a state of turmoil, right? That has quietened down to a very great extent. A lot of people say it's the distance, you know, well away from the Middle East, well away from the core centers of, of, uh, of Islamic, uh, the shrines, etc. And that's the reason why perhaps so much attention is not paid to the Southeast Asian Islamic nations. But uh, nevertheless, this is an area which is always prone to it. There is a fair amount of radical ideology which persists in this area. Economically, they are good, well-off countries in which you may find people coming into the, into the influence of this kind of an activity and spreading the wings out from here. Many, many people from Southeast Asia have been found to be members 
of uh, the various terror, terror groups, particularly the Islamic State. Lastly, the Islamic State, of course, uh, subscribes to people from all over the world. The Among the leading groups which are a part of it are uh, the, the Chechens, particularly from Central Asia, Southern uh, uh, Russia. Indians, we had reports of about 130 Indians who went and became a part of the Islamic State. It is not confirmed as to what kind of activities were they really involved with. Mostly it is known that they were involved with logistics activities and not really uh, employed as fighters of the Islamic State, except a few of them from Kerala who had gone to Afghanistan. Right. So in India's uh, role to that extent uh, is something which is quite admirable in the sense that you, despite the 200 million Muslim population in India, we have found a very, very small a footprint of Islamic State's influence uh, in India as such. As against this, you see Maldives. 200 went as active fighters with the Islamic State, considering that the population of uh, Maldives is sub 1 million. Right? So, to th this, is quite a, this is quite an achievement for India. And one aspect which you must remember is, from an intellectual angle, uh, one of the first controllers of the Islamic State, recruitment particularly, was a person called Shami Witness, who was, if you remember, who spent eight months in Bangalore carrying out coordination activity for the Islamic State worldwide. And he was finally arrested way back in 2015. He was finally arrested. So India has had a role. And there is, an, there is always the possibility of things happening in India. We cannot rule out that. And that is why we need to discuss this. We need to be careful about it. See what are the parameters, what are the indicators, how do we go about looking, creating a concept by which we can ensure that we remain safe from the threats which are now slowly once again re-emerging, at least in, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia, the Middle East, and which have already been persistent throughout in the African states. Sir, आपने अच्छे तरीके से बता दिया कि किस तरीके से ये it's reviving itself and the central organization which is underpinning this growth is the IS. इसमें दो राय नहीं है. अगर आप देखेंगे तो मॉस्को के अटैक में भी IS शामिल था. ईरान में भी IS का हाथ था when in that Karman में जो अटैक हुआ. और जहाँ तक पाकिस्तान में है वहाँ भी यही लग रहा है कि पाकिस्तान में भी IS का हाथ था जहाँ इन्होंने चाइना के अगेंस्ट एक्शन लिया और कबर ये भी आ रहा है कि आईएस इज आल्सो सपोर्टिंग ईटीआईएम टू मेक एन एंट्री बैक इनटू जिंजियांग सो ऑल दिस गिवन ऑल दिस नो पाकिस्तान इज अंडर इट यू नो द वे आई लुक एट इट ओके लेट मी रीफ्रेस द होल थिंग ये आईएस इज ऑन द रिसर्चर्स इंडिया हैज टू प्रॉब्लम्स आई मीन आई वुड से टू फोल्ड प्रॉब्लम वन इज इन द नियर टर्म the near term issue is how to tide over the elections right especially the kashmir elections with the supreme court has said till september we have to finish the second is the long term problem beyond that how do you handle it in the short term what we saw is pakistan trying to regroup its own resources they made way this narrative of from the guardian what it has said about india what that five chap has come out with it. And then now they are starting to do something. And now summer is coming. Passes will open. Routes will open into JNK. No. So how do you, do you think Pakistan is up to something? After all, you've written an article also on this. What And you also, we also know our defense minister ne kya bola hai, we all that. So I would like you to talk a little about this and then the long terms. Thank you. These are very pertinent questions, all of them. Ghulam Fai, of course, is a known, notorious character. He's been in the payroll of the ISI for very long. Been a very effective player. We also got to remember that uh, Pakistan has been adept at the communication strategy, information warfare, and has developed it over a period of time. Perhaps learned a great deal from the Chinese who researched it, the whole concept of information warfare. Uh, after 1990, particularly the first Gulf War. So with all this, it is quite clear that uh, Pakistan 
cannot afford to lose its relevance in Kashmir, if it, the perception of its relevance. 35 years it has invested. Of course, a long time before that has invested much more. But 35 years it has actively invested in this proxy war. Now, that's an important thing, proxy war, right? Proxy war does not necessarily mean only kinetic. Proxy war is of all kinds. And there are grades of proxy war. Pakistan's overall proxy war capability has been diluted to a great extent by the Indian state, the Indian army, the Indian organizations which have come together, the intelligence bureau, the NIC, and all of them have come, which have come together. And the NIA, sorry, and all of them which have come together. Pakistan, because of its low capability at the moment, is trying to maintain its relevance through various actions. You saw a couple of months ago the attempts to revive things in Poonch, Rajori, uh, the area of Bafleas, etc. It had us all worried. It's died down. It's only died down. We have not had any show shot kills or anything in this area. It is bound to come back again at some stage in the summer. At the same time, this communication strategy is being revamped. And the moment you see people like uh, Ulam Fai emerging, you know the ISI is now active, extremely active on its, and the, the ISPR in particular, the Interstate Public Relations Organization, is particularly active now. This was this lesson, this uh, uh, particular article is a very interesting article comparing Kashmir to Kosovo. And declaring, trying to declare very clearly that uh, if the Indian foreign minister, if you're Indian external affairs minister, if he thinks that if he just states that no one can, you know, sort of take away Kashmir and Kashmir is an integral part of India, etc., he's got to think again because the world recognizes that Kashmir is a persistent problem. It is a problem between India and Pakistan. I only draw attention of many people to one or two facts. And that is, uh, 1972, India is the one who agreed to sign this, the, who, who, who drafted out the Shimla agreement, got the Pakistanis to sign it, decided that we will resolve this problem. I know everyone talks about it being a disputed state. It is India which virtually accepted it was a disputed state and we could resolve it amicably if we sat together. But in 1989, Pakistan chose to use proxy war as a means. And as a result of that, I think everything actually got watered down. The, if a state decides to use proxy war against another state, then the other state has got all, has got the freedom to use all other means against another state, the proxy war state, the one which is sponsoring the proxy war state. And that's exactly what we have done. We brought down, we've diluted the capability of Pakistan over a period of time. And you've seen Pakistan today suffering economically, socially, politically, uh, internal turbulence, virtually the economy with the economy, the state down on its, on its uh, feet, uh, on, on its knees at the moment. So Pakistan is in major problems. What it is attempting to do is that over the next few years, while it tries to revive itself, it is hope, hoping that it can revive itself, it wants to maintain that relevance in Kashmir. And because of they'll have to keep grading, they'll have to keep planning, they'll have to keep strategizing to understand what are the kind of actions that they will need to undertake. For example, if these elections, the Lok Sabha elections now, go through peacefully in Kashmir, as they expected to, it will be a big victory for India. If September, as the Supreme Court has laid down, if India conducts the assembly elections peacefully with a reasonable turnout, etc., it will sound a death knell for Pakistan, virtually. Therefore, you can expect that Pakistan will attempt to do something. It is already now triggering small actions. We are, we are in April and you will find by May, June, July sometime, things will start happening. Once again, those same issues like migrant killings, killings of TA soldiers, uh, traffic policemen, small acts to keep the relevance going, somehow or the other. Then international media, like this article by The Guardian, or other articles which are of the type which uh, Ghulam Fai has uh, written, will keep emerging in the international media. 
And the international media you are seeing is not very friendly towards India. With all this which is happening in India at the moment, the manner in which articles are emerging everywhere, everyone's got seems to have having his focus in, uh, on India and always wanting to certify as if things in India are not correct. Now, that is an ideal situation for Pakistan. Joining up with the international media, carrying out its social media activities, communication strategy activities, and small acts of proxy uh, kinetic actions here and there, will at, they will attempt to try and keep this the rele their relevance going. This is despite the fact that they are under intense pressure internally. From the West, particularly from the Taliban, they are under intense pressure from the Baloch Liberation Army, what's happening in Balochistan. Their own ally, the Chinese, are being hit almost every other day by the, by the BLA. So there's a lot of internal turbulence going on. It will take much for Pakistan to actually get away from all that and put its attention back to Kashmir. And that's why you'll find that uh, they will be only sporadic acts. And these may not really work to an entire strategy. I don't think Pakistan has that capability to be able to really strategize towards something in terms of long term. What you are going to see at this time is primarily actions to remain, to keep Pakistan relevant to the issue at the moment. Yeah. So, short term, Pakistan will try to regain its relevance. Vapis, wo bolega sab kor Kashmir mein ya India mein ki bhai hum hai. You don't have a free run. And we're going to, and they'll try their best to interfere with the elections, both Lok Sabha and this thing, and uh, later assembly elections. The challenge before India is to see how to ward it off, how to ward this challenge off. I also feel, sir, that Pakistan has to do something this side for internal purposes so that it can, you know, divert the attention from the western border to the eastern border. Because ISK is active that side. And they have to do something. And you will get, get, you know, though Pakistan doesn't have the resources at this point of time, Pakistan army does not have the capability to move the site and restart the whole thing. But it doesn't take too much. And narratives like what they've come out in the Guardian and all that is the, makes the makes their case for them to start something. So that is something I think which we need to take care of, which you rightly said. That's fine. We'll, I'll leave it at that. The long term. What do we do after this? Because the long term is a combination of a revived Pakistan, if it revives, and ISK, which like it has is expanding its activities. And the chances are that these activities, if they revive and you know go expand, then Afghanistan becomes destabilized once again. So in that end of a context, uh, what, what should we do is the question at hand. You see, um, we have not mentioned the ISKP so far really. And, and when we talk about Islamic State in conjunction with Afghanistan, Pakistan or South Asia as such, it, it is the uh, the branch of the Islamic State, which is the Islamic State for Khorasan for 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 province, for ISKP. Yeah which is the one which is essentially responsible and they are the ones who are probably responsible for what happened in Moscow. One thing um, uh, I would always like to sound our uh, viewers. Remember, one uh, in the world of terror, uh, a big act is a very important thing. Something which Jim Shankar just said, a big act. A big act is a very important thing. A big act messages capability. It messages arrival. Now, if you notice, you go back to the 90s and the early part of the millennium, every time the lashkar e Toiba effectively, you know, sort of put its flag into some part of Kashmir, it would carry out a major atrocity. Chitra Singh Pura, for example, was the message which the LET wanted to send, the Lashkar wanted to send, that they are now embedded in South Kashmir properly, right? Uh, Vandhama, similarly, it was something like that. So, this is an internationally, uh, uh, you know, known norm, which is always there. The fact that the ISKP has gone to Moscow and done it, has taken it well beyond the regional uh, character that it had, the regional identity it had. 
the world is now looking at the it's, it, it becoming once again an international thing again right so to that extent there is no doubt that there will be efforts to try and do something big pulwama was big right uri was small became big it became big by accident right but there is no doubt about it what terrorist groups always look for is something something which is really big this is something that we have to remain fearful of number one why it may not happen in our case is the fact that both the times it happened the last time right uh, uri and in uh, the case of uh, of uh, pulwama uh, the indian government was proactive decisive went in in a very early time frame within 10 days they responded and responded in kind proper kinetic means right this is something which the pakistan state today cannot risk it cannot risk and it therefore to the degree of controls it has got over these terrorist groups it will ensure that a big act does not get conducted does not get executed they will try and keep it within what is called india's limits of tolerance and that is why i still feel where we need to be careful in jammu and kashmir is not internal not the hinterland area the hinterland area is very difficult conducting a major operation today it is the peripheral areas along the line of control if you remember jan shankar would remember the attack on the gun position in the uri valley which was a very very serious yes, uh, fedain yes. attack which took place right in a place called mohra near mohra mohra it happened mohra yeah. In fact, I went there immediately yeah, after yeah. the attack. Exactly. I went there. Exactly. That that the no, Mora was a was a typical act, right? Uri, Tangdhar, Punch, all three major headquarters, brigade headquarters, the areas got attacked by some elements, some suicide elements or the other. All of them are on the periphery. It's easy to infiltrate in one night, carry out an action, and try and evict and get back and get back, right? Similarly, Samba, Vijaypur. Take these areas from Katwa to Jammu. This, these are the areas again. You got very, very vulnerable. So, to my mind, that is the kind. These are the kind of areas we need to keep our attention on them. Not to say that we can't, don't need to keep our attention on the hinterland. Of course, that is very important, and we need to protect it at all times. But these areas are the ones which are particularly vulnerable at this time. And sometimes it happens that uh, you know you get a strike on this. it may not lead to too many casualties and the perception on the other side may be that it's just within your limits of tolerance so to say although limits yeah. of tolerance in case of india have never been defined we have never laid down it that that four soldiers will die or 10 soldiers will die no india can retaliate on anything india mm-hmm. can retaliate yeah. on anything and that demonstration that capability has been demonstrated adequately right so this is in the near term that we are looking at all this happening and long term long term let's just link the global side of it to the regional to what's happening uh, within within india uh, i uh, with what is happening in gaza at the moment the messaging in the in the islamic world is very very intense very very intense you i'm sure if you travel in the middle east and you you know the best place in the middle east i found where you get to know what exactly is the thinking in the minds of the people is smoking rooms at airports go to a smoking room take a cigarette light up throw a small subject here and there and look for you have to know how to do it and look for a for a response and from there you will be able to gauge what the emotions are in in that area i can tell you today the emotions are rising a lot because of the what the atrocities in gaza in particular right so this is something this tide can build once again rise from here what is happening by the houthis is, is is a completely different and unconnected thing right not it's not not such an important thing but this iran syria israel issue has all the, the potential of going far beyond right uh then in that case what happens it doesn't become a it does not become a sunni or a shia show or something like that then guess guess the islamic world combined together and then awkward things start happening from there that is one aspect as far as the international part is concerned regionally here long term you can think 
Afghanistan in particular. I think India, we must look at our relationship with the Taliban. There's tactical reasons or otherwise, but I think it's in our interest to make sure that our relationship with the Taliban is intact and uh, taken beyond. We should come to the assistance of Afghanistan under any circumstances, maybe to the extent of a certain amount of economic assistance or whatever. No recognition needs to be given. No one has recognized the Taliban, I think, in the world until now. So we don't have to do that either. But there are all kinds of diplomatic means by which you show your support. And that's exactly what India should continue to do. Because holding Pakistan in the West in this manner will ensure that uh, Pakistan's capability to pay attention to the East is that much limited. And we need our time in Kashmir to continue our buildup of our activity. We don't want a situation in Kashmir where with all the good work which is going on there, a dilution starts taking place with sporadic terrorist activity coming back again. No, that's not going to be to our interest at all. And therefore, we need time. We need, and if anyone still thinks that you can reduce the strength of the army from here, I think you ought to be thinking no. again. Because that is a very important aspect. This victory has been won, not victory so far. I mean, we have created a positive environment. It because of the joint effort which has been done by the security forces. Now trying to leave it only to police forces to manage, etc. may just create that void which Pakistan is looking for. And this is something which we should not accept. In fact, day before yesterday, sir, self and General Dua, we discussed ASPA and all that. And what we said was that, look, the army shouldn't be withdrawn. It can be kept there. It can be doing its normal activities, improvement, maintain your int setup. You might not be doing active operations. Be in the background. Leave the folk, you know, put the, let the JNK police handle everything. But moving out army from there, thinning out army is just no go. At least till the elections are over and the new government stabilizes and then we can take a relook. In any case, sir, the Home Minister has said this is a thing which we're going to take over a longer period. So it's not of a course. big deal. Not. Yeah. These are issues so, which are spoken of before spoken an election of. or whatever uh -huh. it is. No one has to take any confirmation from a from an indicator which has been given by any political leader at this time. Yeah. The issue which I thought is relevant is what the our defense minister said that look, you try something, we'll come after you. I thought that was also a good message which went across to Pakistan. Uh, it was it was a very good message which went across, but uh, uh, it got misread very badly, and it got exploited by the Pakistani side on the on the other side, which we have countered now adequately. A lots of people like me and you have written about it, spoken about it for our for our viewers. Let me just indicate the moment uh, it was said that ham ghuskar. Mar sakte hai, amne ghuskar mara hai. Pakistan took it uh, literally. You know, sometimes you take a statement and, and convert it literally to your own convenience and say, Deko, Bharat ne andar ghuskar or in extraterritorial killings ki hai. What the, what the Raksha Mantri clearly stated was that these were responses which had happened in the past. With what the, when the surgical strikes were there, we demonstrated, we went a short distance across the line of control and carried out surgical actions against terrorists and did not touch the Pakistan army. And when it happened in Pulwama, we went deep into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, carried out this thing against uh, Jabba Top and against uh, Balakot, carried out the action and we demonstrated that we can reach to that extent also. So, ye demonstrations take a under Akar or Apko Mara hai. And this got converted into as if okay, this is uh, some kind of surrogate Killings which the, yeah, the but has, that's has, has that's okay, sir. But the message has gone home. Message the gone. message has gone home, and that, and I thought also, sir, that he had a more important message when he pitchy put out. When he said that, look, in POK, the political gatvidiya is happening. The time is probably now coming where they will come and say, please take us into India. You know that thing was also a great message which he put across Absolute, for the long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the Baluch issue, the way it is multiplying is causing a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, turbulence inside uh, Pakistan political uh, space as such. 
एंड यू कैन इमेजिन नो अगर यही चीज अगर पीओके में और गिलगिट बाल्टिस्तान में गिलगिट बाल्टिस्तान में और भी ज्यादा स्कोप है इन बोथ प्लेसेस इफ इट हैपेंस कैन यू इमेजिन द स्टेट ऑफ पाकिस्तान कंप्लीटली या सो आई थिंक वी जनरली कवर्ड सर ऑल थिंग्स ऑल बेसिस वी टच टुडे वी स्पोकन ऑफ ओवरऑल ग्लोबल टेरर the issue which comes out is that global terror is on the rise and we have to be clear about it and we have to devise new strategies because the way this whole story is now panning out is slightly different and we have to cat- tackle it at two levels the near term and the long term and we have worked about all that we'll take a few questions if you don't mind sir yes uh, yeah. unless you have anything else more to say no 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 nothing no. maybe okay. i can just add one little thing here yeah. is important to keep you see we may uh, we may be having a perception in india that we have not succeeded our government is not succeeding in convincing the western world and we find too much of negativity coming out from the western world against india while the same negativity doesn't doesn't reflect as far as relationship in context to pakistan is concerned now this is something of concern for us and i think our efforts should not dilute Pakistan, uh, the the West plays to its interests, and there there are times when its interests are completely linked to India. There are times when its interests are completely linked to Pakistan. So I don't think we should get carried away by that kind of a thing. Our efforts should continue, continue to implant that that perception in the minds of the Western world and the Western media that Pakistan is a sponsor of state. proxy war the sponsor sponsor of state terrorism and that it is the core center from where this in, revival of international terrorism global terrorism is again taking place we must remind the world once again of the words which hillary clinton has on said about snakes in the backyard and things like that those must not be forgotten under these conditions yeah i, I there's no doubt about it sir i think that's a very timely thing uh, we'll get on to a few questions thanks raja raman for your generosity uh, okay vishwanathan has a, a longish question sir but i'll put it across because i think it uh, melds well with what we have said the ukraine gaza and houthi conflicts have demonstrated the effectiveness of low cost asymmetric war strategy what is the likely global implication and how can nations handle these terror groups uh if they adopt the same strategy to unsettle their adversaries and what are the challenges before us uh, india's threats and are we equipped technically to avert uh in the event of them employing the same strategy to unsettle their adversaries fundamentally he is talking of a hybrid yeah, threat I, 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 i'm aware I, I, i'm aware firstly yes it's a good question and it's a good uh, it's been well put together uh ukraine of course uh, also hybrid no doubt but uh, gaza the houthi rebels etc all this which is happening these are all now in the domain of hybrid uh non all out they are not all out conflicts they are not conventional wars as such each conflict has having its own characteristics what effect what affects us most from the western side is proxy war what affects us most from the northern side as far as india is concerned is border war connected with many other things related to hybrid you know deep high high end psychological warfare and things like that and over a period of time all these wars if you have seen have persisted now this has gone on for two years and the ukraine war the houthi issue has gone on since 2014 and uh, gaza now is entering a sixth or seventh month right so all up and long one thing is very clear which it is demonstrated is that unlike the past when we spoke of conventional wars the six day war the 14 day war the 22 day war that is something of of the past now if wars come about if nation decide to go to war they should be looking at a uh, pin pricks here and there no, nothing all out no question of putting all your resources together be ready for the long haul long proxy wars long wars of a kind which will take place this is something that we have to be prepared for we as a people are not patient let me tell you we are not very patient people 
We want results quickly. And we have to learn that in such wars, results will not come quickly. Right? You have to demonstrate a capability to absorb and then hit back also. Hit, hit or hit first, await a response and defend yourself strongly. That thing, this is this is a thing which will carry on all the time. It's like a boxing bout, you know, uh, make an action and then, then retreat and, and accept a, a jab against you yourself, right? So this is something about hybrid war, the capability to last longer, which we have to be absolutely prepared for. Secondly, I think one of the aspects today which we have to be careful of, particularly in a place like Kashmir, Northeast also, is the as cultural, the ideological aspect, right? Uh, if you see what's happened in uh, Yemen, the ability of Iran to play this across territories is not, it's not like Pakistan and Jammu and Kashmir where you have a line of control and infiltration is taking place, money is coming in, weaponry and uh, ammunition is being supplied, logistics is all there for the terrorists, etc. Here it is a, it's a long, long supply chains which are there. It is the ideological aspect. The Shia ideology, which is which has come, which has allowed Iran to have that kind of hold over the proxies which exist, or the proxies of Iran are all over West Asia. They're in Syria, they're in northern Iraq, they're in uh, in, in Yemen, they are yeah. probably in Western Saudi Arabia, Eastern Saudi Arabia itself. So lots and lots of places like that. So you have to un understand these conflicts culturally. If you know nothing about the culture of the area in which you are fighting, you don't deserve to fight there. You don't deserve to be even <laughs> deployed there at all. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> and this is something that we in the army, having learned the hard way, all of us fought these wars in the beginning um, with that notion of taking out a weapon and fight. It doesn't lead to anything. These are temporary victories you get in battle. The victory which you have to get is of the mind, of the heart, ultimately. The people, the center of gravity, as you always say. Right. So, uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult to write pamphlets on hybrid warfare. It's very easy writing pamphlets on conventional warfare. The armored division in battle or defense as an as a operation of war or attack as an operation of war. These are very easy to write because there are clear-cut things in this. Hybrid war doesn't have that. There's the challenge which comes there, right? And a lot of people feel very uncomfortable the moment you find uh, all notions are in the gray. All notions are in the gray. I mentioned this in an article yesterday that when gray zone hits you, don't try and respond in black and white. Always respond with gray. gray. Because that will keep your enemy also guessing. And the, what the hell have you tried? What the hell have you done? Right? So, this is a very, we are at a very interesting juncture. For one, technology is taking off, artificial intelligence coming in, space wars taking place, the speed of inter the internet expanding in uh, phenomenal terms, etc. All this is going to come to the assistance of hybrid, right? And we will have to increasingly look at new innovative methods of trying to fight hybrid wars. I can't give you solutions to it in 10 minutes here. But I'm sure one day we will talk about hybrid war as an entity by itself. John Shankar and myself will discuss this. Yeah, we will. We will. And incidentally, we've served together in the Northeast when he was the brigade I'm in the Corps and I was a commander. And, you know, that's a different ball game. That's a different hybrid altogether, which is emerging there. This is a different hybrid. So we'll talk about it in a holistic manner. Okay. Uh, I'll take two questions in this. I'll first read that sort and then the next one. These terror groups, old and new, are hybrid warfare vectors of the present unipolar power of the world. There is a pattern in their progression which appears to be premeditated, your views. So he says it's. Yes. Right. Would you yes. treat the Moscow attack as a terrorist attack or a proxy attack by some state actor? I know what you're getting at when you say a proxy <laughs> attack by some state actor. Everyone's pointing fingers at the United States and the Western world as such. No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I think the claim has also been made by the Islamic State. In this case, the ISKP has made a claim on it. Uh, but as, as I was just talking about grey zone, these are areas which are left in the grey. You were left guessing. You are hitting out against something completely wrong. 
you could be completely wrong therefore identifying your targets and objectives becomes very very challenging in a, in an environment uh, such as this but the, as far as i am concerned what i what i look at the moscow attack is a demonstration by the iskp of its arrival in central asia and its capability to make inroads deep into russia and the next possibly could happen somewhere in eastern europe for a while you know right it could happen the iskp will make efforts to demonstrate somewhere or the other you don't know it can be in pakistan it could even be in india but although there are no in such indicators in india but going so deep and doing it in moscow was something very very it was, it was not something expected at all to come back to the previous question uh, on the aspect of the existing state act, existing actors who had uh, carried out these activities over a period of time hybrid activities over a period of time can you just switch that question back again yes I'd sir i like sir. to see that question we can just dwell on that question if we can yeah old and new hybrid warfare vectors of the present unipolar world part of the world there is a pattern in their progression which appear to be premeditated ah uh, it's a difficult question to answer because this whole aspect of uh, the unipolar world as such has already transformed to a great extent into a multipolar world multipolar as such you you are looking at it already happening around uh, around the world particularly in the post pandemic period it seems to be even more uh, evident but uh, i would not at this stage this question to my mind still remains a gray area in my mind it's not is early yet to say whether whether uh, their their progression is something which is premeditated as such it will take time perhaps before we can really give a clear have a get a clear cut indicator of what that really is at the moment yeah next is a interesting question sir uh the fundamental of this question is what we we need to think uh because he is giving you a new concept or rather throwing a new challenge so you have said you have worked on disaster management can there be a new category of disaster defense where we can have systems to attack or neutralize through incoming directed energy weapons i will not i'll take the directed energy weapons out but can a disaster be a new form of hybrid war Uh, engineer disaster yeah, that's the more absolutely, question absolutely. absolutely i have understood your question and a very good question incidentally last 3 days this question has been put to me by a lot of senior officers right <laughs> and uh, so i i am in the position to give you an answer because i have at least uh, examined two disasters in india in the recent past in the light of this what you're saying right i'm not going to name anything here and there but uh, it was felt that things which happened disasters which happened in the himalayas in the himalayan region in the recent years could have been done through a seeding of uh, cloud formations in those areas to create a massive cloud burst uh leading to what is called a glacial lake outburst glof as is called a glacial glacial lake outburst flood right uh this is the under broad understanding which a lot of people are going by today to say that such a thing is possible recent incidents of this kind that we have had in both the cases i can tell you there has not been a speck of rainfall in that area at the time when that flood took place surprising you will wonder how did this happen then well it is a uh, an element of climate change an element of global warming that uh, sheer precipices had uh, blocks of ice as big as 600 meters long and 200 250 meters wide scarping off from the face of the precipice coming crashing down to 3000 meters generating a massive energy generating massive heat by which the block melts and creates a flood not only that it leads to an air of almost a, a burst of air pressure which breaks all the vegetation all the trees in that area which get merged and which create a debris flow and then the debris flow comes down 
It happened in one case where we, uh, one of our dams also burst. One of our one of our um, areas, one of our very important uh, locations in one of the states got washed away completely. Uh, in the other one, we had a, a flooding of a whole hydroelectric project. A run of the river project in which uh, the tunnels got flooded and over 200 people died. So you're, you're right. I mean, this kind of a thing can create a massive security problem for you. But there is no proof yet to say that such a thing, such that cloud seeding has taken place. I was given an indicator of cloud seeding. I would say, I would go to the other side of it and say directed energy. Directed energy was directed energy used against these uh, faces of the of uh, the escarpments as such one can't say one can't say there is no evidence on that yet so in the disaster world is at the moment let me tell you it's a very interesting aspect uh, the disaster world and the security world are still very wide apart and they at some stage will have to come together this is one of my endeavors which I'm trying in India myself to try and bring the two together. Remember that uh, climate change is going to be a persistent threat for us. And, uh, and uh, climate change is going to cause a huge amount of threats and which are uh, against uh, deployment of our own armed forces in different parts of the, of the country. Look at Pakistan. What will happen to it in terms of climate change? See what will happen to the, to, to the uh, areas fed by the Indus River which keeps drying up and then flooding all over again right so these are these are aspects which are there very much in the glare very much in the in the horizon which we are looking at but there's nothing certain at the moment it will be very interesting one day in fact jan shankar and i were supposed to be doing it one day if somehow we got postponed and it never happened we want to do a full session for you on disaster management in india it's, it's the next big thing, let me tell you. It's the next big thing which is going to happen in India. Yeah, I'd like to add one point, sir, which you just said. What everyone must understand is the resources and the capabilities you need to fight wars and the resources and capabilities you need to fight disasters is almost the same. Absolutely. Where the navies fight wars against other navies and also do disaster management worldwide. So the capabilities are the same. So in fact, I capability that in the world, uh, two, uh, there are only two domains which require all of government effort. One is war and the other is disaster management. Disaster. So the thinking for both these have to come together at some point of time. And, uh, and at a national level, this has to be under one umbrella. How we have to do it is something which is, I think, in most cases, it's not only in India, it, I think internationally also this thinking is just about coming into play. Absolutely. But let us see where it goes. Sir. 